So hello everyone and welcome to the St Bride Foundation. If you don't know me, I am Becky Chilcott and I work here as a volunteer running the events programme. And we're so delighted to have you all here today to hear the fantastic, fabulous legend that is Peter Savile here this evening. Um, as you may have just gathered, we have an in-person audience and an online audience. So welcome to everyone online as well. It is so fantastic so many of you could be here with us today. If you aren't aware, we hold events like this to raise money for this fantastic institution. All money raised from your ticket sales, so just by being here you have helped us immeasurably. Basically, the money from your ticket sales goes to, to basically upkeep our fantastic Grade 2 listed Victorian building, the management and conservation of our unique and irreplaceable <coughs> library collections and the running of our brilliant inky print workshop and of course our learning programme. So thank you so much for just supporting us in this way, it is hugely appreciated and hopefully you will come again or many times if you've not been here before. Like this talk, we have other fantastic people with us who are coming to do talks in the future. You can take a photo of this, you can look on our website, find out more. Next week, we've got the fantastic Clara Villiamy talking about her mum's work, Shirley Hughes and her legacy. We've got the Justin Howes Memorial Lecture, which has just been announced, and Jessica Hish is going to be travelling over from the US for that. We've got our fantastic Waze Goose on the 28th of April. And if you don't know what a Waze Goose is, Google it or ask one of our fantastic volunteers. It's basically a big meetup of printy people who love letterpress, printing, that kind of thing. It's a fantastic event. There's lots of cake to eat, and it's a really great celebration of letterpress and all the things we do here. And then on the 9th of May, we have the fantastic Emily Yates, who will be doing an online lecture talking about incorporating accessibility into design. It's something I know I'm woefully ignorant about and have been really trying to work to learn more about. And I think her talk is just going to be absolutely illuminating and brilliant. I've been told by someone who's worked with her that she's just fantastic. So do try and come along to those if you can. Um, and if you didn't know this building, some of you know it really, really well, and so I'm apologies, you've probably heard this for the hundredth time. We have a labyrinthine building, which is full of absolute treasures. We have our library collections, which you can access every Wednesday by booking an appointment in the reading room, and you can see all the fantastic treasures we've got in our collections. You can book a tour, you can do a letterpress workshop, book binding workshop, wood engraving. There's just so much more on offer to here to have a look at and become a part of. So, of course, you can go to our website for all these fantastic things. And next week, we are taking part in the Big Give Arts for Impact campaign. So this is a new campaign to support arts and culture charities working to achieve social, societal impact across the UK. And through this campaign, we'll be raising money for this, like this talk, for our unique library collections, learning programme and building. Donations given next week between the 19th and 26th will be matched. So if you say donated us £10, it will become £20. If you donate us 100 quid, it becomes 200 quid. So it's a really fantastic thing. So one donation has twice the impact and will really, really help us. So I've handily put a QR code up there. I got very technical, which is not like me. So if you do want to get the link, you can use that or you can go onto our social media channels, our LinkedIn page, and you can find lots of information there. So if you are able to support us, we would really, really appreciate it. So I can, I'm very pleased to say that my bit is nearly done, so you will not have to listen to me any further. Um, so I am hugely delighted to introduce tonight's guests. We have Peter Savile, who needs pretty much no introduction, as pretty much does Paul Barnes. So... As co-founder and art director of the independent UK record label Factory, Peter created some of the most iconic record covers of all time, best exemplified by those he designed for Joy Division and New Order between 1979 and 1993. His radical approach seemed to break all the rules, sometimes omitting information about artists or titles, or employing visual codes fundamentally questioning modes of consumption and communication. Going, to work, going on to work extensively in fashion and the cultural sector, his achievements were celebrated in the Peter Savile Show at the Design Museum in 2003. His first major show in a contemporary art museum was at the Migros Museum in Zurich in 2005, and he continues to exhibit internationally. His first monograph was published by Fries in 2003, and he is a Royal Designer for Industry and won the London Design Medal in 2013. And in 2020, he received a CBE in recognition of the fantastic positive impact of his work over the past 40 years. And Paul Barnes is a huge supporter of the St. Bride Foundation, and we absolutely love him, and the work Commercial Type does for us absolutely fantastic. So we'd just like to say a huge thank you to him for being here to help um, 
just have a fantastic conversation with Peter. And Paul is a graphic designer specialising in the fields of lettering, typography and type design and publication design. And he is partner with Christian Schwartz at the Commercial Type, a type foundry based in London and New York. And if you're in the room, we've got fantastic specimens from Commercial Type. So do have a look at the absolutely fantastic work that they produce and go and maybe buy or use some of their fonts because I can personally say they are wonderful. So that is it from me. I would just like to thank you all being here in the room and virtually. And I will, once I've done some microphone juggling and slide juggling, I will hand over to these fantastic gentlemen. Thank you very much. So let's go. I presume it worked. Does it work in the room? Yes? Okay, great. So there we are. Oh, yes, something it says, yes. Yeah. So that's what saying object means. Oh, what does it mean? It means some of signs and symbols. Sign, symbol, what what yeah, okay, that's that's what I so thought. Yeah, semi optics of time. I, that's what I thought it might mean. Yeah, typography, but. not just about the letters, but the way they're used. Mm. In the last forty years, typography's been quite central to your work. Uh, yeah, and mm. This is where it's my ball start. It was. I mean, from the beginning, it does start there. And um, fortunately, the person most responsible is in the room. So Malcolm Garrett is here. Um, and I was just, um, when Becky was speaking, I was just working it out. Um, 50 years ago, just seems a bit uncanny, actually. But it's true. It's true. 50. 50 years ago, it, it could be said that Malcolm made a kind of a temporary academic detour. Yes. Um, we, uh, in 1974, we um, graduated from grammar school um, and guided towards graphic design by a kind of uh, innovative, bright, young art teacher that we had at school. Um, I think it's fair to say that neither of us really knew what graphic design really was. I mean, most people didn't in those days. Um, my father described it as commercial art. Thought I'd be writing people's names on office doors. Um, but Malcolm and I had displayed an inclination to um, towards graphic work, but that was mainly because in a way we were trying to make things that look like record sleeves as, as teenagers. Um, the record sleeve being the kind of preeminent medium of visual innovation for young people in the UK, certainly in, through the 70s. Um, so we were doing that. The art teacher said, you boys should do graphic design. So. In um, September 74, I went to Manchester Polytechnic and started a foundation course. And Malcolm crazily went to Reading University, where, where you then went. And yeah, it, yeah, well, this it, he's responsible, I mean, um, or to, to be, be credited, credited with everything. Um, Malcolm and I, you know, we, so we did our first term and I remember distinctly we, we, we got together at Christmas and talked about what we were doing. And what I was doing on Foundation Course was kind of, I mean, it was confusing, but it, it was fun. And sounded pretty much like what Malcolm was doing was pretty boring. It was not fun and not, even, oh. not confusing. Yes, he seemed, I think he mentioned that they'd done a Do Not Bend sticker, you know, and things like that. So we were, we were running around painting rooms in the dark, and Malcolm was stuck Stepping on... Stepping tight. Yeah, well, I, perhaps not even yet. Anyway, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, we talked, decided that this was not the best place for his inclination and his talents, and we kind of contrived a plan whereby he would then apply for first year graphics after Christmas, and, and with any luck, he would then join me on the graphics course at Manchester. So you've been saying year. Yeah, which is, so that's what happened. And he bought his reading list back. Yeah, so that's it. So the, the, the extraordinary sort of serendipity was that um, when, 
when Malcolm turned up first year graphics, Manchester Polytechnic, I don't know. It would be understandable if he kind of felt a little bit um, insecure about that, having not had the benefit of a foundation mm. course. Um, but he did have a reading list of basically typographic history, which goes back to, you know, well, principally to the early 20th century and, and the way that so much time design came out of the art uh, movements of the late 19th, early 20th century. So Malcolm, a reading list. Um, a reading list of the history of graphics was kind of unheard of on the curriculum of an arc of a graphics college. Well, it's certainly at Manchester, and I think the same could be said of many colleges in the UK at that time. Apart from Reading. Apart from Reading, yeah. So, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the prevailing idiom in graphics after the 60s had become, in a way, the New York school of, yeah. you know, visual pun. And that seemed to be what all of our teaching staff were orientated around. Um, and and the, the previous history of graphics and its relationship to art and design in general was not really considered, you know, relevant, interesting, vital, or would not be of any <clears throat> interest to young people. Um, <clears throat> I personally, by 75, so I was 20 years of age, having seen visual puns for like 10 years or so, they were not really doing it for me. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, a... a you know, a logotype for a restaurant was applauded if it was a bite mark out of a plate. And um, I kind of thought, well, let's, I know what a restaurant is. Um, um, I know it's not about eating plates. And I actually want to know what kind of restaurant it is. This is not telling me anything. So from my point of view, even at the age of 20 and 75, um, you know, my kind of socio-cultural awareness was developing a little bit. And I was much more interested in the nuanced difference between things. And the visual pun approach didn't address it. And I actually hated that way of work. I did subsequently come to appreciate and understand it. And I realized that in the kind of evolving proto-society of the United States, yeah, makes sense. in the 20th century, where you had 250, 300 million people who definitely did not share a common culture, generally did not share a common language, and you needed to communicate to them effectively, visual puns worked, because you didn't need to know anything to get it. Anyway, that was not my way of seeing things. And in 75, I was totally preoccupied with kind of, you know, rather superficial style-based, well, not superficial, actually, it's unfair to say that, within a way the style-based graphics that communicated through a look. So I was a bit obsessed with Bush Hollyhead, Dan Fern, um, um, Michael English, um, that uh, that group of people who were mainly represented by a guy called Nick Thurkle. They were all at the agency called NTA. And they were like the hip, George Hardy. They were like the, the hip graphic designers in London. And I liked that work. And then Malcolm turned up with the reading list. And given, in a way, the free-for-all of the graphics course, Malcolm accessed the amazingly innovative work that, that was in that reading list, principally, you know, well, this patient, was, patient zero is that. It was 50 years before 1974, so 50 years yeah. back to 1974, yeah. then 50 years back to that. So, it seems a long time so, ago now. I mean, that book... I mean, I'm, I know introduced Malcolm to things that, you know, his family life and education had not informed about. Um, I had exactly the same response when I picked it up on his desk one day. And Malcolm took the spirit of the work in that book, combined it with the kind of pop aesthetics that we shared. And in first year graphics, Malcolm created a kind of, you know, day glow constructivism. And 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 also um, 
hosted a, a Dada show at the end of the year, which kind of blew everyone away, including the staff. So Malcolm, by the end of first year graphics, Malcolm was like the star student. Uh, and the staff kind of were wondering, you know, why he was doing, why he did it. Anyway, this all happened just before punk. And then when punk happened, I was able to look in that. You leafed through it. And see a route map for post-punk culture, I, I felt. So, so you looked through it and you... Did, did, did Malcolm... Okay, well... Give, give, let you have his... Malcolm had pretty much done Lizitsky and Malevich and Co. And soon there was a designer called Al Nadal working in London who had a studio called Rockin' Russians and Al was doing the Russian yeah. stuff. And it's interesting when you're at college, you, you kind of, you're competitive with your fellow students, but also you don't really want to go to the same place because that just seems like you're copying them. So you find someone else to copy. So, <laughs> so um, I kept on looking in the back of the, Pioneer's book. I kept on looking at, at this guy, Tischold, yeah, which was just hyper cool. It was much, much cooler than the, the, other, the other work. And I would look at it and think, wow, this is great, but couldn't possibly do that. Um, but I, I liked the, the, the rigor and the coolness and the sort of calmly subversive quality of the early tissue, you know, the Dinoy typography and things like that. I liked it a lot. And, um, and that would be where I would go when I got the chance to do something. And I mean, funny the, the, I remember distinctly, there's odd days in one's life that you kind of remember. And I remember the day that I asked Malcolm if I could borrow his copy of Pioneers of Bob typography. <laughs> And he said, no. He said, get get your own. And, and I said, like, where do you get this in Manchester? <laughs> um, and he said, I don't know. He said, you could try the college library. And I said, oh. I said, where's that? Um, I mean, I've been there a year longer than he had. And I mean, he was quite irate. And I, I, won't, I won't say exactly what he said because we're like online. Um, but he swore at me, you know, and, and told me it was a big building on Oxford Road. And, and I said, and then it was the worst bit, I said, then said, do you, do you think they'll have it? <laughs> anyway, at that point, he did kind of lose his patience with me. And he, so anyway, I went off to the library and, and they did have it. In, in fact, they had a you know a whole corridor of of books of graphic history. It was all there, <laughs> all and more. And I started, and I was just it was amazing. And I just started taking them off the shelves and looking in them. And most of them had never been out. Yeah. In fact, I showed you one recently, the PS the PS the, the, the PS Vart book. It it did, the only person that ever took it out was me, so I kept it. I, I said I'd lost it and I paid two pound fifty and I kept it. And um so and, and I and I went that afternoon to the college refectory and, and to have a coffee with this big stack of books on the table in front of me. And I think this is like end of second year, early third year, so this is nineteen seventy seven. And um amongst the books that on on the table in front of me, I'd spotted something called the black square. And, um, you know, there was basically effectively a, you know, a black page and Kazimir Malevich, black square. <laughs> and I, I kind of sat there in the factory looking at this stack of books and knowing that the, this thing called the black square was there. Yeah. And, and I put my airbrush away and I just thought, um, I just, I said to myself, well, you don't know anything, Peter. You don't know anything. The stack of books represented to me like the beginning of all of the things I didn't know. And, and that was the day that my, in a way, my real education started. And, and that the day that I wanted to learn things, not because it was expected in me by other people. 
And for the next, I don't know, next 10 or 15 years, I, I, yeah. I certainly learned as much as I could about graphics and typography. We, you love collecting books, don't you? Well, I did. I'm not anymore because there's nowhere to put them. Now they're making, yeah. you know, little stacks on the floor. Um, and, okay, so last week I was in someone's book collection in a room, let's say three times the size of this and higher. And from floor to ceiling around all the walls are bookshelves. I think there's this is fifty. I think there's fifty thousand books. Okay, wow. it's Karl Lagerfeld's book collection, uh -huh. and it's quite clearly um, self-defeating. I mean, I've already I haven't looked in my own books for for years. But you told me all about your bedtime reading during the eighties. In the eighties, that's different. But now, and I would imagine that most of the people in this room have got lots of books that they got before. That this we still fall for it every weekend. We go out, they've got books that they bought last weekend, and they've got books that they don't know, even know they've got. And I bet there's people in the room who have sometimes bought a book a second time because they didn't realize they already had it. So that is how it is with books now. But, but this is quite strange bedtime reading. Oh, this is good. Okay, so so once I started to learn, I mean, I. Not, not that quickly, but, you know, reasonably quickly. During the course of 1978, so I graduated, we started factory. During the course of 1978, I realized that typefaces were, you know, a, a form of coded information that enabled you to evoke associations that you wanted to make. Mm. And given the nature of communications design and the conveying of information through letters, they were the primary source of effectively styling a piece of work. So I, so I actually, I didn't even need to, I just wanted to know. So I, I kind of got interested in, in typefaces. And of course, relatively, it was kind of easy then. There weren't, I mean, relative now, there weren't actually that many. Yeah. And, and there were some basic rules. And this book, which if you go to the, I don't know if we've got the frontispiece of it, it the Librarian of St. Brides was the editor yeah. of this yeah. book. And so I would, mainly in secondhand bookshops, because they were not available anywhere else, because, I mean, most people were not interested. I mean, the key thing for anybody under even 40 in the room, no one, no one was interested in typography. I mean, I mean, there were some nerdy neurotic people were, but generally nobody... They still are. Yeah. No, I mean, nobody just interested more broadly in, in contemporary culture or pop culture was interested in typography. When we were at college, there was nothing more boring than typography. Um, I, I distinctly remember that I fell asleep uh, on the floor in the typesetting room at, at college one day before this was, you know, the year or so before I'd woken up to the, yeah. you know, to the, the, the essence and power of it. So. It was really boring and nobody was interested. Um, so uh, this made it remarkably effective when not just me, Malcolm and I used type. Yeah. Because no one was doing it. I mean, it's like rediscovering an old world. You've rediscovered yeah. all these typefaces that are yeah. kind of and, letterpress. And, and, and I would find brilliant. these books, usually, you know, secondhand books and, and, and you know, car, um, book sales and things. And, and um, yeah, it does seem a bit weird now. I would, um, they became my reading matter at, at, at night. You know, I haven't read a novel for, for, for more than 50 years. I read a lot of type books. <laughs> so, and you started. So look, I'm, okay, you started, so then that happened. You uh, started making stuff, pizza. Okay. So, I mean, that's actually quite an important work. It's kind of very chicol, but it's also set in avant-garde, very yeah, tightly no. spaced. You see, um, it's letter-setted, and it, I think it, I don't know whether it's all letter-setted. It's just that 
when I was thinking about it recently for this, if it wasn't Rick Lecture Set, I don't know how I got it typeset because I didn't know what typesetting was. And so, unless There's I no one taught you, at no, school. no, 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 no one taught, no one taught about any of that stuff. Not nothing. You don't actually in the seventies at Manchester Polytechnic, which is considered the second best graphics course in the country. And no one taught you about how anything was done. No mechanical artwork, no typesetting, nothing. You were just expected. You were expected to like look, develop your ability to think, then get a job, and you will be taught the methodology on the job. So. Um, I don't know how the time for that got set. Um, I mean, avant-garde. I, I was looking for a blocky sans serif that matched the lettering on the industrial sign that I had stolen off a college door. <laughs> and so it looked to me that that, Pretty. that font would do the job. I mean, it, 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 the naivety of that first poster is extraordinary. It's got two spelling mistakes in it. The same word is spelled differently in different places. Which one are those? I think Durutti is spelled wrong in two places, and, and Russell Russell is spelled wrong. <laughs> it's full of. I mean, it's the the way that I recognise bootlegs on that poster is that the spelling the spelling has been corrected. Um, so so it's a funny hybrid of Dinoy typography. Yeah, and you know you might say NCP car parts. Yeah, and and you know the day that I met. Tony Wilson, I went to meet him at Granada Television and offer my services. And I, I'd heard he was organizing a club night. I was still at college. Um, Malcolm was already working with the Buzzcocks and doing incredibly exciting things, and I was envious. So I was going around Manchester begging to do something real. Um, I went to visit Tony. Tony was magnanimous, and he said yes to a poster. And he told me that he was trying to arrange a club night, and it would be called The Factory. Which I, at first I thought, oh, it's really naff, because it just seemed like, it just seemed like a kind of Warhol reference, which at the time, like 78, just after punk, it seemed very passe to me. Mm. Um, but we were in Manchester, first industrial city, so therefore a place called The Factory, not entirely inappropriate. And there was that used hearing protection sign on a workshop door. And I had been admiring it in a kind of craft work type way. I had been admiring this sign for years. So when I went back to college that day, after being asked to do something for a place called The Factory. Two and two together. Yeah, so I stayed until like eight o'clock and took it off the door. You still got it? <sighs> it's got what goes around comes around. At, at an exhibition at the Corner House in Manchester in the late 90s or something, I don't know when it was, someone took it off the wall there. Oh. So we don't know where it is. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, so I built the poster around that, that, that noise prevention sign. And, and, and if it's in avant-garde, it's in avant-garde. But it's, there's none of the quirky avant-garde characters that immediately no. give it away. But, but you told me your tutors really hated your rules. You started to use really bold rules. In that final year, there was a typography tutor called Sid Harley. I think not Sid Harley. What was he called, Malcolm? Sid Harley. Sid Harley. And I, I did one little bit of college work, a letterhead, um, in my new inspired by Yantish old style. Now Sid was used to seeing me like airbrushing neon, and he looked at this, and. He was balding with a grey beard like everyone else now. So um, when he pulled on his beard and he, he said, Peter, did you do this? I mean, I was like, well, who else? I mean, I mean, Malcolm would do lots of me, but he hadn't done that. And I said, yes. And he went, hmm. And he looked at me and he said, why? And I just said, it seemed to feel right now. And he just shook his head and walked away. It was the same Sid Harley that when my degree grade was pinned up on the wall, he greeted me in the lobby of the college before I had seen my grade. And he said, 
he came up to me and he said, I should probably say congratulations. So I thought, thank God I've passed. And I said, really? And he said, do you not know? I said, no. He said, go and look. He said, I'd like you to know that I vehemently objected. <laughs> Whatever happened to you? So I said, thanks, Ed. Well, he died. I'm sure he died. I mean, he was elderly anyway. But well, it was, I, I, was not, I was not expected to pass. And it had been decided by the college that an example had to be made of me for my poor discipline, attendance, and general attitude towards the college curriculum and seeming to know what I wanted to do and that was not what the college thought I should do. So they had decided, I think, well, they'd even decided before I started third year because nobody would be my tutor for the third year because they knew that I was, I was, I was down to fail and so no tutor wanted a fail student. I didn't know this, I found it all out later. So, so they were determined to fail me just because they thought I should be failed. So I, anyway, I wasn't failed. The external assessor gave me a, um, a good pass, which upset some people. It upset a lot of people. It upset Malcolm, actually. Uh, it upset people, but, and I didn't expect it, but it was, it was very, it didn't really matter because, I mean, everyone in the room knows that no one ever asked you what you got at college. I mean, they just look at what you do and that's it. No one ever asks what you get. But of course, when you're like graduating, you think it matters. It actually doesn't. But it, the nice thing was it mattered to my parents. And because and, they'd supported me, didn't really, you know, my father didn't want me painting names on office doors. Uh, and so it was kind of nice that I passed. Because pretty quickly you started doing some pretty interesting stuff. So the first factory record. Which again has those bold so, rules. So, so as the year progressed, Malcolm left Manchester immediately because he had great job opportunities and none of them went to Radar Records. You know, I procrastinated. I was being really pathetic about leaving home and having to rough it in London. I knew that I would go to London because I was set on that. Um, but I did procrastinate and for the, in the latter half of 78, whilst I built up courage to go and, you know, stand on my own two feet in London, uh, we founded Factory Records. So, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I mean, it, it, it wasn't going to be anything. No one involved knew what a company was. Nobody really knew what a record label was. And it was more an altruistic act to help some of the bands that had played at the club that we would release a record. So Tony decided that we could release a record. So that afternoon that we had that conversation, I know October, November 78, Alan Erasmus, Tony Wilson and I said, we will be partners. We didn't even know what being partners meant. A couple of years later, we, it was a very scary mm. role to have. But we said we'd be partners in something called Factory Records. So. Therefore, that gave me a kind of unprecedented platform within the sphere of communications design because I was effectively my own client. Um, we, we put out records that we didn't expect anyone to buy. So therefore, there was no, there was no guidance towards um, profitability or popularity. Um, and Factory developed as a kind of autonomous platform where nobody was employed, no groups were signed, there were no contracts, all of the artists retained the rights in their own work, mainly because, you know, the, 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 the central person was Tony Wilson. And Tony was retained by Granada Television on a, you know, a, on a, a, a handsome income. So Tony didn't need the money. So in a way, it became a kind of a folly. I mean, Tony didn't appreciate that some of the other people did need some money. He didn't quite get that. Um, but effectively, we had a kind of a, um, a cooperative. I was going to say organization, more of a disorganization, um, where every individual was 
free to do exactly what they wanted and not be answerable to anyone else. So that someone had to approve this record. Nobody label. approved anything. But then, the, I mean, the easiest example seen that it was a record label was Martin Hannett's position. You know, when Joy Division went in to make Unknown Pleasures, Martin recorded their playing and then told them to fuck off. And Martin had a record to make. Is that like what you said to the bands? Well, I had to be a bit more polite. Martin was quite friendly. He was the, the producer. But the, the key bit being was Martin had a vision of that could be fracked out of Joy Division. And he wanted to do that. And, and, and the group were superfluous to, to his work. Ian was actually quite interested. Ian was taken by Martin's way of seeing what Joy Division could be. Uh, to this day, Peter Hook and Bernard Sumner don't really like Unknown Pleasures because they thought they were going to make a punk album. So everyone did what they wanted to do. So the groups were never under any pressure to do any performance or release anything other than what they wanted to release. That's why the singles were never on albums because as young people, they thought, if I bought the single, why do I want it again on an album? Not very clever. Teenage idealism. And, and you know, I mean, I sought... I sought approval from my colleagues because you just do as a graphic designer. Um, you know, you, you seek approval often to, to find, you know, a way with something. But I couldn't get any. So when you came up with this poster, which is kind of... Tony just said, do, do it. That was before we were even a label. So that that's follows the yellow one. And I just moved on through the Tishol pages of the book, basically. I just... I, so you're a modern one day and the next day a classicist? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I was neither. I was signalling associations. And with a kind of duality... Some of it was um, a kind of a frustrated altruism on my behalf because I was seeing things which I was not seeing in my everyday experience. And I was actually angry. You know, I would look, you know, I would look into the, you know, I would slowly discover cultural history and look out what was then modern day Manchester. And, and I was very disappointed. I was really disappointed. Uh, I, and I, I remember thinking, you know, time and time again, I thought, when the everyday can be so extraordinary, why is it so tawdry and meager and, and shabby and, and, and lacking in, in, in any intelligence or cultural intelligence? Why is the everyday so awful? So, so when you did this post, had you actually heard any of these bands? So, so there's absolutely no relationship. None of it has got anything to do with music. They, they were doing what they did, and I did what I wanted to do, and I was able to use Factory as a medium of, well, I said a duality. How I would like to see the world, but I have to admit how I would like the world to see me. So in the book that Becky mentioned, the Freeze book designed by Peter Savile, there's contributions from various people. And there's a contribution from Paul Morley. And Paul Morley really unsettles me. I mean, he and I didn't get on at all 40 years ago. But in recent years, we have gotten on and there's, we have a kind of mutual respect for one another now. And in the essay that he contributed to that book, he, he, he concluded, the book is called Designed by Peter Savile. And he wrote at the end of his essay, Peter Savile has always been designed by Peter Savile. <laughs> and I thought, oh, Paul, Paul Morley is, I mean, I've never been to see a, a therapist or a psychoanalyst, but... It's what you're doing now. Yeah, but Paul, I think Paul Morley would make a really good one. Paul Morley can see things about one that you have not yet seen yourself. And so I've, I've, sub, I've read, subsequently I've read other comments from Paul where I first thought, 
what you yeah, that's completely wrong and then i've realized maybe it's not that wrong after all anyway paul was right i was i was i was creating me as much as i was trying to improve the everyday around me so what does when you got to the time of closer which is incredibly well, classical okay it starts to get a bit more sophisticated because it gets very a little sophisticated bit, now we begin to get a little bit academic um you know the name of the gentleman whose book this comes from y yeah you, you 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 took it here's a pmt of it it's it's, it's uh it, it's called no it's not that book it's the Schriftlich book. Yeah, well, this is the book. It's in The Development of Writing. Right. The Development of Writing. Hans so, Edward Meyer, 1959. No, that, Where did you find it's this? It's a book? slim, in a second hand bookshop. It's a slim, tall, like A4, one third A4, slim uh, little document book that may well have um, uh, accompanied a PhD or something of this gentleman's research into the origins of writing. And it was exactly the kind of thing that I was consuming and collecting and and in there i saw um what he believed to be the earliest example of serif lettering so go oh, yeah there it is oh there it is the earliest example and he referred to it as lapidary lettering and you see this, this is how one learned so i learned that lapidary was stone cut and 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 he put forward the 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 proposition the thought that that the appearance of the serif may have come from the practice of whitewashing the letters onto the stone prior to to um, incision prior to stone cutting and that actually the serif shape might have been the the result of, of a brush and the pressure on a brush um, and i found that terribly interesting in 1980 um, and and i liked it it was just in the book so um but you hadn't seen the Trajan column in the Victorian album at all. No, that would have meant going out. No, I, I was in London. I was in London. By this time I was in London. Actually, I think I had a job at Dintless. I had, I had my studio yeah, sure. was in this offshoot of Virgin. And I mean, I, I lived I was living in Stretton, and the office, the studio was on Portobello Road. So I probably didn't get there until like lunchtime. Um, but then I wouldn't leave until midnight. And I didn't really go out. I mean, it, it, it is fair to say that through the 80s, I didn't really see much of the outside world. I certainly didn't see much of what was happening in music. I didn't get to watch Top of the Pop. So, you know, like, Top of the Pops 1982 on, on BBC4 now is completely new to me. I'm seeing it all for the first time and thinking, fucking hell, it was awful. So, but I missed all of it because the problem with the music industry is that from the visual art point of view, at least, at least once they've got a front cover, the standards... I was going to say are incredibly low. They're below low. They are subliminal. They're, 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 there is no standard. All that matters is getting it done. And you would be, you know, you would be asked to do a last minute full page ad for a music paper at like six o'clock in the evening and, 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 and say, well, when's this for? And they say, well, it's for this afternoon, but they'll take it at nine in the morning. Now there was no nine in the morning for me. So that meant that I would have to do it before I left. So, I didn't get to see the 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 what's it called the model what's it called the the V and A, where the Trojan all, column. Yes, it's in it's the plaster cast. The plaster room, yeah. The cast room. Is it called the cast? I think it's called the the cast court. That's something like that. I know. I saw all of that later. I mean, I saw mention the Trojan column uh, in some of the books I had. Anyway, I used this. I saw that font, and I wanted to use it. Well, why didn't you just use Bembo? Why didn't you just go for the easy routes so you could get home a bit earlier? I don't know. I mean, I know how the sleeve happened. Because there's the image. Isn't yeah, the, it's all very strange. But once there had been this agreement to use this photograph from 
the cemetery in Italy, Genoa. I thought actually, I I would imagine that I didn't go in search of a type. I thought of the typeface that I'd seen in this little book and thought, this is it. So, so uh, also, you... I mean, it's a great, go back to closer, go back to closer. I mean, it's a great, I mean, this is a great font. I mean, it's really beautiful. Well, you made me redraw it later. Because yeah. um, when I look at, when we look at the actual, it's very wobbly. Who actually did all this? Okay, so, so. You didn't. You no, didn't no, no. It was up. one thing seeing something in a book, the next thing altogether executing it. Um, I had to take the book to a little typesetting house called Expose, who I'd learned about from my very brief job I had for the first 10 minutes in London, a little typesetting house on Edgware Road. Now, they were the only typesetters that I knew. Okay, I, I, I was 24. Mm. And I'd been in London for like a year, mainly stuck in a studio doing things. So, I, and I didn't know anything. And I'd never worked for anybody. I'd not had any experience at all. So I was having to make it up as I went along. But so I knew about Expos and I said, can you set this as type? And they said, yes, if we make a headline font. So, you know, I understood what that was. So they photographed it, made a headline font and they set, they set the type. So that's why it looks a bit wobbly. Because it's it's you know, quite endearing. Often. Well, it is. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you know, inscriptional type was a bit wobbly as well. If you you know, yeah, when it comes to it. So, um, so uh, I was okay with wobbly, and uh, and you know, they were they were to, to use a headline font. Um, they were winding something along and it making an exposure and winding along the next letter and making an exposure, and. Um, I mean, probably, you know, the, some of the better typesetting houses with sans serif typeset really tight so they could just have everything touching, that was easier. But this was difficult for them. The typesetting houses in London in the early 80s had no idea at all as to why you might be choosing to use a, a classical font. And they had no idea as to why you would want it set open, or as I learned, as metal. Yeah, I had to, in order to explain what I wanted, I would have to take photocopies from old books and say, I want it set like that. And they would say, why do you want that? I said, fuck off, I want Just, that's how I want it to look. Okay. And I mean, in the typesetting houses were some really expert guys at the bigger houses, and they were extraordinarily good. And, and if you showed them what you wanted, they would do it. But they didn't understand why I was trying to evoke these historic ways of doing things. But, so, so this isn't really typeset. No, that's not typeset. That's. Um, but but what, where's the lettering come from for this? It comes from a um, an engraver's stencil um, in a workshop in Shepherd's Bush. Trevor and I took those metal plates to a bloke he knew um, who engraved who engraved Level Toast Vart into steel plates. And then we, I, I left it outside the window for two weeks and it oxidized and rusted a bit. And then we photographed it. And it was inspired by- Ben Kelly. Ben Kelly. Where, yeah. Where's this? Has someone stolen this? No, it was, um, I didn't really see it as stealing, particularly from people I knew. It was more like kind of friendly. No, I mean, I mean have you still got this? Oh yeah, I have metal plates, yeah. It was like 10 years. I, 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 um, I knew that Lovell Terrace part was good. Okay, I'd seen Joy Division play one night. They'd, they'd been taught that they had a song. And it was, in fact, the last time I saw Joy Division play. And it was at a college here in London. And, and as soon as it started it, I thought, oh, this must be the song. This is the song. Um, you know, with bands in their early days, they, they do what they do and they generally they struggle to write a song. Um, but, but they, when they finally get one, you, they know it, you know it. So OMD, when they finally wrote, Love, um, Enola Gay, it's like you hear it straight away. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good the performance is. It's a hit. And, and, and the evening I heard Love Will Tear Us Apart was extraordinary and 
I was... To me, Joy Division... They were like the essence and the fabric of the of a city. Yeah, they were kind of the urban condition, and it was this very kind of evocative room. This level terrors apart, and I was I remember you know driving around thinking, how can I, how can I, how can I get this 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 how can I get the feeling. Of, of, of this title from the hard fabric of a city in, in glass or concrete or something. And so I asked Ben, I, 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 you know, Ben was interior architect and I was friends with Ben and, and we talked a little bit about things. And I said, I'm, I'm, how can I get, how can I get something you can't tear but feels torn? And, and he went off and from, came from the bookshelf with his uh, Royal College of Art a dissertation, which was called Metal Lined Cubicles. And he had made the cover for Metal Lined Cubicles from mild steel, engraved Metal Lined Cubicles. And I said, thank you, Ben. More thank yous are required in the future, but anyway. anyway we, we yeah, yeah, we have to rush on, we have to rush on. Okay, so this is just gets, it just gets a little bit more, it could, the, 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 the yeah. The tour, the, I mean, basically I, I, oh, this is something I've not said for a while. I, I went on my own grand tour. I went, I did the grand tour via the secondhand bookshops of London. That was it. And, 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 and I so you found tried to, I tried to learn something and, and I gathered a lot of information and when there was a, a, a situation when there was a, a a title or something to work with, I then kind of did a sort of word association. It's the interesting thing about type is that the words themselves have connotations. And I was only just thinking about that yesterday. So it's not just mm. It's not just the use of a font and the, the, the aesthetic um, kind of characteristics of a font. Words themselves either help or, or give us problems. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when we looked in, you know, looking for type samples that are set in other languages. It's quite interesting. And we can act, sometimes we see the font because we don't actually understand the word. Um, and words can be a problem, and they can also be remarkably, you know, helpful. So ceremony. So ceremony just took me straight to, uh, you know, a hanging, a kind of like maybe mid mid century hanging in a church somewhere, um, and the, the Albertus was just perfect for it. The, somehow, somehow Albertus and the word ceremony. Just, just sort of fell together beautifully. Because then you have literally yeah, same part. We just move on. Um, so I've realised I haven't, haven't. Yeah, that's right. No, we can. I can rush through these. So because it's all, it's all the same thing. It's all coded information. To, it's all coded information to evoke something that I felt at the time was like timely, hip, or directional. I mean. You know, at the beginning, I just wanted to be in the in crowd. But, I mean, who, who are they? I mean, you know, I mean, I did Well, yeah, but, I mean, it was just this notion of the in crowd. I, like I said, I was designing Peter Savile, but I didn't even go out, so I never even met anyone. So, so, and so I was... Everyone knew you. Okay, but I was, I was tracking what you might call a zeitgeist. Or these days, you might just be a bit more modestly call it a sense of nowness, and there was actually in the post-modern break from the early seventies, maybe through until the mid nineties, there was a sense of an evolving nowness, um, and a sense of direction that you would pick up from fashion, 
our music, a speeding of the net. And, and I was tracking where I felt it was going from my own instinctive, intuitive feelings about things. So um, one day in Ian Shipley books, not secondhand, in Ian Shipley books on... Charing Cross? Thank you, Paul. On Charing Cross Road, I picked up this book that seemed to me, for all the world, to be like ice cream Bauhaus, like ice cream modernism. I thought, what was this? And then on the front it said Fortunato de Peras. It's definitely ice cream. It's an Italian ice cream parlor uh, of modernism. And then a friend of mine, a very important friend called Tim Slack, who worked in fashion but was an extraordinarily cultured man. Tim talked to me. I met him really early on. And Tim would talk to me about fashion and nowness in, in an art-related, art-relative sense. And so I, I learned a lot from Tim. And, and he used to talk to me a lot about Marinetti and futurism. And I would just sort of glaze over and not get it. And then this afternoon that I found the Depera book, I thought, ah, this is that futurism stuff. And I really like it because it's so up. And so you expressed it. Whereas like modernism, Bauhaus, and we do associate with a certain heaviness, the, the Italian stuff is so crazy. And also so utterly taboo at that time. Nobody even talked about futurism. It had been completely, you know, um, relegated because of the later associations with fascism. Nobody talked about futurism. And I just thought, this is amazing. So I had this book on futurism. That's all I, that is all I'd done. Rob Gretton brought the now new order round to my studio one afternoon. They were in London trying to make their first post Joy Division album. Yeah. And there was a repeat performance of what had happened a year earlier with Closer. With unknown pleasures, they gave me the wavy diagram. That's documented. Yeah. When they were making Closer, they had not time to even think about a cover. They came to me, I showed them the Bernard Pierre Wolf. Um, for some reason, they liked it, and we had the Closer cover. So Rob just repeated the process. He came around to his studio and said, Peter, we don't have much time. What are you into this week? And this was this. And I said, well, if you don't have much time, I'm really into this. And he said, give us the book. And I gave them the book, and they went into a separate room at a Virgin Label offices with, with, us, with post-it notes. And they emerged five, ten minutes later with post-it notes, two post-it notes in. And he said, do this. Just make the words fit. And then, and then I said, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, something like this. And he said, he was very clear about this. He said, no. Just do this. We do not have time for you to fuck around. So, so you got a reputation already. So, yeah. Um, so on the strict orders, and Brett is here this evening who worked with me at that time, on the strict orders of Rob Gretton, we were asked to convert a Depera poster into saying New Order Back 50 movement. Now, it was all serendipitous because for me, when they said, I said, what's it called? They said movement. I said, thank you. Because, it I mean, lastly. Fu futurism, which is a movement, but also principally found around, around the, 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 the new dynamism of the 20th century. I mean, it, there could not have been a, a better title for this reiteration of De Perro. I mean, it's a political movement, and it's all about movement. And, and, I, and I, I mean, with Brett and I struggled to do this because Brett had to find the typeface, which was exceedingly difficult because of an old 30s Italian font, and amazingly, he did find it. Um, it's German, actually. Yeah, is it? The, yeah. the font is? Yeah, it's called Elegant Grotesque. I know, but it was used in Italy. Yeah, but it's, in, it's okay. German. And it's got a kind of, it's the German font. Um, the, the thing that I remember thinking was that Marinetti would like New Order. Yeah. And, and, and that I could see 
because in this transition from Joy Division to New Order and the, and the sequences came in and the beat came in and the kind of driving sense of forward uh, the dynamism entered their, their music, I kind of thought New Order could be the house band of futurism. So at the same time, you're doing Section 25. Oh, fucking hell. Well, which is, I mean, the question yeah. I have is, you do these record covers, do they represent the music? Because I listened to this. No, did, did, did you know, the other, I didn't, I mean, I didn't hear Closer. I didn't even hear Unknown Pleasures when I did it. I mean, I'd just seen Joy Division perform a couple of times, and it was pretty difficult. And so when I actually heard Unknown Pleasures, the day I delivered the artwork, I, I was, I, I was stunned. But I've told that story too many times, so the, but you, you don't. I mean, the, in the music business, I don't know these days because I'm an old guy, but in, when I was young and doing record covers, the artwork deadline was the same date as something called the cut. The cut is the final mix and sequencing of, 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 a, of, a, of a record, a single an album. And so the artwork deadline cannot be before the cut because the sequence of the tracks and the details are are set then in 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 you know set in steel literally but so you can't have the deadline for the cover before the cut but the moment the cut is done somebody can say where is the artwork so and the group have only normally only just finished they've spent the night before trying to figure out what the sequence of the tracks is so more often than not you will not hear an album until weeks later you hear it Unless you're very keen, the fan base will have heard it before you hear it. So with this record, this is actually based. Yeah, it is. So this was, I mean, to, to be kind to Section 25, it was not a great album to listen to anyway. Anyway, they, it's another fact, it's a, it's a, it's a factory cover. A very, very nice guy called Larry, who was the kind of leader of Section 25. He asked me to do. He said, can we have something European, psychedelic, and a bit oriental? So the Europeans... The Europeans, so, I mean, I had seen, you know, my typesetting books were becoming more sophisticated. This is like 81? Yeah. It's a long time ago, Paul, 1981. Um, I had a Bertold typesetting book, which was like the most beautiful typesetting book I ever had. And... There were samples of Bertold setting. And there was a particular sample of Bembo. Yeah. And it was just like a block of Bembo. And you thought, I'll have that. And I thought, I'll have that. So that's what it is. So it's the, it's the relevant information executed as per a typesetting sample. That's why there's no punctuation. It's just set, set solid. And I mean, you shouldn't do, obviously you shouldn't do it. Um, we did it because, well, yeah, but we did it because it didn't matter. Obviously over the years, I've seen that approach applied many times and, 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 and it's a bit, it's kind of inappropriate because you can't read it. I mean, if it doesn't matter that you can't read it, fine. But I see that done in situations where I would actually quite like to read what the name of this book is. So, so this record probably sold, I don't know, 100 copies. Now, the next record was a big hit. It had okay. three to five hits on. And this is really commercial, not factory records. It's not it, factory, but because my relationship with OMD started at factory. Yeah. And I was friends with them. And, and it's fair to say that Andy McCluskey of OMD is the one, was the one musician that I actually kind of became friends with. And, and Andy and I are still friends. I think it's because if I did not worked out, he was going to be a geography teacher. So in a kind of like slightly sort of middle class, mm. low brow way, we were able to get on with each other. So, so I, I, I got on well with Andy and so had a unique relationship with them. So even though they were then on Dindis Virgin, um, there was at this time a similar degree of autonomy on, granted to me and a sort of relational exchange. So my girlfriend at the time, Martha Ladley, was reading the book, Morality and Architecture by David Watkin, mentioned it to Andy, and it became Architecture and Morality. 
So, so you went through a kind of Gil Sands phase, which is kind of... It's British modern. It's absolutely British modern with a little bit of, we've seen what they're doing at the Baron House. Well, well you, you said to me a few years later, it's English, humanist, kinky, geometric, spiritual, mm. streamlined, artisan, oh overground, eternal and modern. It is good though. <laughs> Amongst all of those things, the, Why didn't the, you just tell the me photography, that? The, 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 the image is actually in a window. So that's actually a die cut on that sleeve. And on the inner sleeve, on one side is the photograph of a doorway. And on the other side is a photograph of a stairway. Very clever. Architecture morality, roots to God. And the photography is by a friend of Brett's called Robin Roddy. Um, and he just happened to send us these pictures. And Brett said, maybe we can use these. So we did. So, so this should have made you lots of money, but the... You, well, you don't get money. But then you use... No, but you don't. I mean, you get... From doing record sleeves, you get fees. That's why there's no long-term prospects in it. And ironically, the one group who thought it might be only just to give me a royalty because of my significance to their work was actually All Cash from in the Dark. But it happened to be the royalty on the next album, Dazzle Ships, which nobody bought. In fact, my royalty was so low that Virgin Records have never bothered to account to me. <laughs> So, um, so you don't get, you do not get points. You used to get a couple of grand for doing an album cover. And of course, if you don't grow out of it yourself, you become obsolete anyway. Because, you know, like a 20 year old in a band, they don't want their dad doing their record sleeve. And, and, and their dad, I don't know if you're the dad's Peter they, their, or me now, like grandfather, should grandfather should Sam. not be doing. You, you should not be doing it anyway. It's not appropriate, because because you don't know. I mean, I I in with all of that work in the eighties, and particularly the ones we've been looking at, I was doing what I wanted, not to do. I was doing what I wanted to have, mm. and. And, and in that sense, I was on a similar wavelength with my peer group. So, and, and some of them wanted it as well. So did you want a nightclub called the Hacienda? <sighs> and why did you set it in Gil Sands? Ben Kelly. So ben I mean, we're with English Industrial Modern. But you added something, didn't you, to the scene? I did. Well, I noticed that if you put, well, the C in Hacienda does formally have a cedilla. Yes? Are you sure? Yes, it does. Hacienda, right? Yeah, it has a cedilla. If you see the word Hacienda set correctly, it has a cedilla. I didn't add a cedilla. It, I'll go, it can have a cedilla. Let's put it that much. <laughs> and, and a cedilla is not unlike a number five. Yeah. Okay? And following the C is the letter I. Therefore, creating a 51 in the middle of the word, which happened to be the catalogue number for the club. That's how I did it. 51. That's how I did so, base graphic design piece. Yeah, so, so, so the cedilla, the cedilla had to stay. Um, and the club happened briefly because when Ian Curtis died, a lot of people went and bought Novel Toes Apart and they bought Closer and they thought this was quite good. So then they went and bought Unknown Pleasures. And Factory Records was, as I said, not a company. Nobody was employed. There no, were no contracts. And Alan Erasmus's flat, which was our default office, um, was inundated with money. I mean, there was a windfall of money. Um, Joy Division got their half, because they would get half, not like 10% on record company, they got half the profits. And nobody knew what to do with this money because nobody knew what to do with money. Tony already had a nice house, so, he had a, so no one knew what to do with the money. And by this time, Martin Hanna and Rob Gretton, the manager of Joy Division, were partners, there were five of us. And Tony and Rob thought it would be a great idea to give the money back to the young people of Manchester for their support and with respect to the factory having been a club night initially. Martin Hanna vehemently disagreed and said, you know, I have no idea about running a club. It's not what you do. We're supposed to make records. We should spend that money and build a recording studio. Martin was, of course, right. That's what they should have done. Rob and Tony, though, were hell-bent on some kind of social project. 
And it, it was decided that we would open a club. And that was the Hacienda. And, and it became a hole in the ground that all the factory's money, and then lastly, all of New Order's money, got thrown into that hole of the ground for the next 10 years. But the great thing about it, it was the incubator of the next generation. So that the Mondays and co, that whole next generation, the whole Manchester thing came out. So for Factory to have had like two generations, yeah, was in a way quite impressive. So ah, okay. you're doing growing up with Nicholas Sorota. Yeah, of okay, so, so um, Nick Sorota was, I always like saying this, was the first client who did not have a guitar. So in 1985, the Whitechapel Art Gallery was closed for not refurbishment, rebuilding. And, and whilst it was closed, Nick um, thought it might be timely to, in a way, activate or restyle the graphic identity of the Whitechapel. He sent his deputy director, Mark Francis, to, to meet me and ask if I would be interested in creating a logo for the Whitechapel. And so you came up with this. So this is 85 and I was 30. And I had seen the need for an exit out of music because I said there's no there's no life there no long-term life and art and fashion were the obvious places for me to go so funny enough it, art came first and and but I was curious as to why Nick had sent Mark and I said this is this is very interesting but you know why and Mark said you have come to our attention. And then when I spoke, then met Nick Sorota, which was scary. Um, I had come to their attention and they felt that the pushback from the younger artists would be alleviated okay. if the gallery was able to say, oh, you know, Peter Savile's going to do your catalogue. And maybe that worked or not. Um, the thing is that it just turned out to be really awful doing artist catalogues. Um, considering this like almost complete autonomy that I'd had with record covers to do what I wanted to do, I suddenly found myself deciding how much white space should be around someone's fucking painting. And it was like ironing shirts for people. And, and I couldn't bear it. I mean, we struggled through to do the logo. There were a few funny moments um and actually we couldn't do it we i mean brett's here this evening he's you're right he's been on a long flight from san francisco but i mean he would agree we couldn't do it and because we didn't know how to do it it took like a month for i mean fortunately the gallery was shut for a year so there was a chance it took more than a month to realize that we could just use the word Whitechapel and we didn't necessarily have to have art gallery as well. That was like a huge breakthrough. Oh, maybe we can just make a logo out of one word. Amazing. Because we didn't ever, we didn't know what we were doing. And, and in the end, we couldn't find the lettering. And then actually Brett, I have to credit Brett with this. Brett said, well, what are they doing at the building? He said that aren't they creating a new minimalist reductive gallery in a way hewn out of that turn of the century rather ugly building in uh, you might call it historic building in Whitechapel and I said yeah he said well and then he said this really fucking stupid crazy thing he said why can't we do that with a typeface so so you found this book of so I, I, well it was like I said Brett you can't he said I said what do you mean he said why don't we strip out the serifs from like a classical font and I said Brett that's nuts he said well we don't have any better ideas. So, and we didn't have any better ideas. So he went and got a book. He went, you know, how to draw a Roman alphabet. And he fucking drew it. I mean, obviously it's 85, so pre-digital. Brett drew it. And then ultimately, and Nick liked it. The, Nick, Nick Sorota loved the idea because he could read the idea. He could like, I mean, you know, curators, Curators do words as much as they do pictures. And, and Nick could read this idea of, in a way, the hollowing out of history or the reshaping of within a historic context. So Nick Sorota really liked it. And ultimately, in order to, in order to create master letters of a suitably high enough resolution. How big is this? They're huge. 
the A1. Wow. So he and one of Malcolm's colleagues, Gary Muat, I believe, yeah? Brett and Gary Muat, or Gary might have found this, found a thing called a Robocom. Not Robocop, a Robocom, which was, I think, an architectural mapping yeah. machine. And they put the letter information into the Robocom. And with like felt pens, the Robocom drew out these huge letters. Oh, there you go. Gonna have to and, speak yeah, fine. and it created this very ungainly, but quite, you know, um, characteristic font. So we've got plenty more hits to go. Yeah, yeah. Better speed up, Peter. Yeah. I can do them very quickly if you want. But well, yeah. Okay. Uh, Two words. New order. Um, what is it? Muller Brockman? Yeah. Back to modernism, you said. Back to the beginning. Oh, freaking hell. All right. So 1985 was, my, 1985 was my own self proclaimed year zero. By 1985, this layering of historic reference had become tedious to me. I found an Eve Klein book on a friend's bookshelf in Paris and declared my own year zero. And I actually didn't really want to do anything. And there was this record and, and I couldn't figure out what to do. And there was a, there was a big impasse. And I remember we had a meeting in London and, and Tony Wilson and Rob Gretton wanted to know what was happening. I said, I can't do it. Why? Well, there's just nothing that I wish to, these things say, riff off. There's nothing I want to quote. There's nothing from history that I particularly wish to re, re, reintroduce. I said, I'm, I'm trying to, I said, the only thing that matters is, is them. What do you mean? I said, well, it's just the band. It's the band. So let's take pictures of the band. And this was like, oh my God. I mean, yeah. the last I'm thing New Order sure ever wanted was to have their picture taken. And so there was like a hush silence around the table. And then Wilson said, brilliant. So, Rob, we then conducted an experiment whereby the individual men was New Order came by mine and Trevor Key's studio and had their picture taken. They knew not what for. <laughs> but we did the pictures using an extraordinary new film called Polar Pan Polar It was a Polaroid roll film. It was so fragile that it got withdrawn eventually. But it had just come out and we used this Polaroid roll film and let each member of New Order art direct their first speech, art direct their portrait. So you could do, um, you know, you, you do a roller film, process it immediately. And it was, in, it was amazingly like, oh, it's just a kind of built in sort of art filter, this film. Everything looked good that you shot on it. And they would see immediately their pictures and say, I oh, don't mind that one. Okay, go, you know, go back, we'll do that again. Third roll, done. It was, I mean, they were like, is that it? I said, yes, it's a great picture. You can go. Really, I can go. Yeah, you go. So, so we got the four pictures. And, and what's the typeface? I haven't got to that point yet. I'm asking you to get. I know, but I there's there's a there's a mistiness to that image because there's tracing paper around it because I did not want to make anybody the front. So the reason there is that dust wrapper of of, of vellum around it is because. If somebody became the front, it would look like a record sleeve. The picture of Stephen Morris was by far graphically the most striking. So Stephen, the drummer, was going to be on the front. But I did not want to put the type onto that because it would make it the front. There was an art catalogue on the shelf with a vellum dust jacket. And Brett and I looked at it and we said, let's, let's put the type on tracing paper. Now, even though I said a couple of minutes ago, I did not want to make historic reference, I wanted a modern font. But in 1985, I, I wasn't ready to go to Helvetica. It was like, that's a fucking step too far. That's so amazing. so I looked through one of the old type books and I saw something called Noisite, which of course still had these slightly kind of modernist connotations and it was called Noisite, which sounded quite good. So I said, let's, let's use Noisite. So we use Noisite. And... Um, you know, it was going to be like another 12 months before the Helvetica came out. Ah. Willy Fleckhouse. Willy Fleckhouse. The famous factory cassette system. And yes, it's a tribute to the, to the, the, the book series of Willy Fleckhouses with spectrum colours. And, and, you know, basically it's a typographic system. Each group was given a colour. 
and they were all retrospective. These were cassettes that were coming out after the fact. We did not want to use the plastic cases. So we made these little kind of literary looking boxes. I mean, people like them. I kind of, they're a bit clunky, but people like them. They go for a lot of money. Yeah, well, people like them. So, 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 um, so this is Peter okay. Pavel in 1986. Okay, 1986. Festival a, a festival was hosted in Manchester called the Festival of the Tenth Summer, basically 10 years after punk had happened. And Wilson organised various events. And he said, I've got you a room in the City Art Gallery. And I said, what for? And he said, well, exhibit something. And I was like, what? And he said, well, whatever you want. So I was given the room, the size of this actually, this is a perfect match for the room, in Manchester City Art Gallery, a famous Victorian building. And so I just explored what I was into at that time which was optical character recognition typefaces, something that you know, Brett was forever finding am amazing reference material for. And we were fascinated by OCR typefaces. And I was fascinated by the, you know, the kind of the computer reading capabilities of them. I was fascinated by the non-aesthetic decisions that were made in their creation. So they were not about how they looked. They were just about purely how they functioned. I was beginning to collect early versions of things like barcodes, which were amazing comp geometry compositions, which were not made to look good. They were just made to trigger responses from machines. So I found that a very interesting, non-aesthetic aesthetic. And I was fascinated by these, by these fonts. So we made a sculpture show in fonts. As you can see, the big blue thing is, an, is a zero. And we did numbers, Festival of the Tenth Summer, so we did a countdown. Um, the four is self-evident. The eight was amazing. The eight is actually OCRB, which when you see it blown up, is made entirely of, of, of jagged diagonal lines. It only looks smooth and curvy when it's reduced down. If you, when you blow it up enormously, it's all jaggedy. And the one on the floor, I'll just go back from my foot, the one on the floor is the number two. And the one at the back, or the bits of a number two, made out of bronze and sandstone. And the one at the back is an example of the of one of the most badly printed OCR numbers recorded that was still readable by a machine. Okay, next. So this is this is this Brett. is Brett. Yeah, it's kind of Brett. It, it is actually Brett from a work it's point very of view. Beautiful. Um, it is very beautiful. This Dido. Is it? Yeah. Okay, it's Dido. Dido Brett. Yeah, he probably remembers. Um, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it was Peter Gabriel. Yeah, it's a Peter Gabriel cover. It was a difficult gestation. This one, um, there was a completely other cover done that, in the end, nobody liked, or they, they liked it, but it just didn't really work. And Peter, I, I don't know how much Brett knew because Brett had been working a bit with Peter for several months. I I was not a big fan of Peter Gabriel, so I kept out of it completely. Um, but basically, I think what nobody really knew was that Peter had had a bit of a kind of romantic disruption in his life. And, you know, the wife leaves, scold out and that's what always happens. So um, he split up, I think he split up with somebody. And the result of that was this collection of actually quite extraordinary songs. Um, oops. Gosh. Um, and so it, it, and his manager, a very lovely woman called Gail Coulson, knew that he had made an extraordinarily good album and his habitual reluctance to be on his covers had to be overcome. So we had to get, she said, Peter, please get a portrait of him that will help cross this record over to a wider public because they will like this record. So one side of the cover is a picture of Peter Gabriel done, done a la, um, uh, low Life, that New Order thing, yeah. autograph film. It was just a few months later we did the same again. And 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 the title had, every month the title seemed to be changing. And then ultimately Brett said he's going to call it So. It was originally called Good. That was one. I'm sure there were several others. One was called Good. Anyway, so it ended up with So. And that, obviously you can see that could be a problem. 
So, not, not when you do it like this. No. And, you know, so, I mean, it, it could be so very, um, you know, lacking in any presence. But it was an opportunity to, in a way, go big. So where Brett went big with it and combined Roman and Italic, and it's just extraordinary. We're going to go quickly now. I know. He did that as well. I don't read really, it. I mean, and did he do all of all of my typographic work is either Malcolm Garrett, Brett Wickens, Paul Hetherington, or you? So I don't really know. Why I'm having to be responsible for all of this. Um, Brett did the, the the touch by the hand of God is probably you know a, a fine example in 1986-87 of a saying. Okay, Helvetica. Helvetica, come back. And then that's similar Helvetica Italic asymmetrically set for a Yoji catalog a year later. I kind of like that idea of it sliding around a bit. But, but, but then you go... They're to... all... What well, they all are, Paul, just to, to... They're all... They're all just signposts. The important thing is, and from my point of view, they were all signposts to qualities... Where's that? Oh, it's our things. It's not mine, though. Oh, it's falling off the thing. Oh, it's fell off your thing. It fell off your thing. Yeah. Okay. So they were all, they were just signposts to qualities and styles and aesthetics that I felt were timely to become part of our everyday again. And of course, here we are, you know, some years later, they have. It's all totally normal now. All of this is totally normal to the point that to add. To, to, to point of tedium. The problem with it all now is that everyone is doing all of it and it's now become meaningless from point of view of any, uh, any, not authenticity, but any, any sense of communicating a meaning. The problem with it all now is that Everything is so beautifully and intelligently and so culturally wrapped up that it doesn't actually doesn't reveal any authenticity or truth to that which is the product or service enclosed. So whereas once upon a time by then it, you could a certain looks could be could be guaranteed to be signaling some genuine intent. More often than not now it's signaling Possibly a lack of content, but wrapped up to look good, like a designer hotel or all the rest of it, so or another perfume. I don't know why you asked me this the other day. I have no idea. To be honest, I have no idea why we did Badoni display. It's it's kind but of we did. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of. I don't know why we did it. I mean, I know why Harrods copied it a couple of years later, but I don't know why. I do not know why in 1987. Somebody said, get the Bodoni out. But we did. And it's quite nice. Now, this is much, much, much more interesting. And this is probably Brett's masterwork. This substance here, that New Order substance, was not an album. The CD had arrived. And because the Joy Division and New Order material that had been released as a single was never on an album, you couldn't have, for example, Blue Monday on a CD. I mean, it seems to be obvious now, but nobody had thought of a CD single at that time. So therefore, we, Tony felt that we had, Tony and Rob felt that we had to conceive of some kind of compilation medium, which would mean that Tony could listen to Blue Monday on a CD. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> so, they dreamt up what you could call a greatest hits, but that's a bit of a misnomer in the context of Joy Division and New Order. They'd never had a greatest hits. So, so they, it's like a compilation thing. It was an excuse to put things on CD. So, so the, this is the one that came first. Joy, no, it couldn't have done. New Order probably came first because of Blue Monday. Okay, then, then we'll do Joy Division. So then we'll do Joy Division. Now, whereas with New Order, I was following real time. New Order was my conduit of nowness. In 1987, I could not reconnect with Joy Division. I just couldn't do it. There was no thread. The trail had gone like 
seven years earlier. We closed the book on Joy Division with Still, and that was it. I couldn't do Joy It was like, it meant trying to do a Joy Division cover. And that was a terrible thing. There's Peter to put your thing on. Anyway, by chance, I came across, oops, some kinetic sculptures by a Dutch artist called Jan van Munster. Here we are. And it was weird. Have you got Energy Peak? Have you got Energy Peak? No, the pointy no. one. Okay. It was Energy Peak that I saw in a catalogue printed by Lectoris, who were the printers for the Whitechapel and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, the, the printer's representative who visited the UK, Lectoris's representative, was a man called Jan Jungapir. And he would come to see us to collect our Whitechapel catalogues. And when that happened, he would, he would sometimes bring a recent publication from lecturers. And he brought this Jan van Munster catalogue, which he thought I would like because it had black and black on black uh, use of UV on the front, which I did like. And I flipped through the Jan van Munster catalogue and there was this work called Energy Peak, which is a two meter, stool, a two meter tall steel cone with an inverted refrigeration unit in the top. So the top part of this, this spear became frozen, was frozen, so it was ice. So it's a two meter, spike with a top of ice of you know frost smooth perfect and i saw it i i i think brett was probably with me that evening i went fuck that's joy division it was so joy division it was uncannily joy division it had this sort of hard steel kinetic cold a kind of sharpness to it. It was so Joy Division. And so I went off to Holland with Trevor Key, a photographer, to photograph the Energy Peak. And Brett stayed in London, stuck with the problem of Joy Division. And, and I always understood, to me, Joy Division had always been a combination of two things. The, the iodine, yellow lit, wet streets of Manchester and, and underpasses. So in a way that the post-war modern city, the city at night, and the rather sort of sullen Gothic revival cathedral of kind of Jerusalem. So for me, Manchester was always this dichotomy, a kind of the, the modern industrial, well, not even modern, almost de decaying modern industrial city, and this rather pompous, a portentous, Gothic revival history. And so, in a way, Unknown Pleasures and Closer were those two things. They were my, and Brett knew this and we talked about it. And when Trevor and I went off to Holland to photograph the Energy Peak, and by chance, that neon, I mean, Brett came up with a, a more ridiculous idea than the Whitechapel logo. He came up with this ridiculous idea to combine a historic font, and we always love Garamond, with a sort of super modern, industrial, futuristic, industrial font with, with vowels, uh, with Vim Krau's, Vim, Vim Krau's new alphabet. And, and it, was, it was a ridiculous idea. It was a totally ridiculous idea to put the two together. And when I, just, when I saw it, I just thought, fucking hell, that is the, that is the best thing I've ever seen. I mean, we slowly in the 80s, we got from rechanneling the past to occasionally creating something new. Like I felt with Blue Monday, you know, I kind of created something, I made a contribution. And, and, and with this tight combination, Brett, I think, I feel definitely did something that, 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 that you would not commonly see. So we're just going to go... And Vim Crow liked it. That's good. It, it, it provided, it, it was a renewal of interest and awareness of the font. And he told me that and he said, actually, thank I said, sorry about that. And he said, no, not at all. Thank you for doing it, which was nice. So we're just going to okay. finish Good. Now because we've gone on so long. Good. We haven't this, done that. This, this only, content. We haven't loads of things we haven't done. I know. This took 55 minutes when I rehearsed it. We'll have to have. I didn't realize Peter wanted to talk. Well, you, just to be fair and, to Peter. 
I, it, 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 is, it, it is. No, we've only got five it, minutes. It is impossible. It is impossible for me to account for the work without some kind of context. I know. And also the time when it was done and the, the context of, of, of time. And, you know, as you said right at the beginning, it started 50 years ago. So in 1990, I was tired of these industrial references within the factory identity. You know, the little kind of, you know, kind of icon thing with smoke. I mean, you know, by the end of the 20th century, it was like over. And this was a very kind of retrogressive way to think of industry or the industry. Um, and, and, you know, we saw Rotis around a little bit. I think it was quite new in the late 80s. Wasn't yeah, this yeah. was Rotis Semisans. Yeah, and, and Brett and I talked about it a lot. And, and we actually, we had a bit of a thing about the whole proposition of Rotis, the kind of organic, yeah. linear but organic quality of Rotis. And, and also, of course, it's multiple serif, sans serif iterations. That was also very modern. But mainly is it was its kind of almost organic, ergonomic quality that we liked. And, and I saw it as, um, I saw it as being very green. We would call it now very green. Mm -hmm. I saw it as a kind of um, um, energy factory, a kind of um, solar, a, like a sunny solar panel manufacturer, factory, factory in a kind of, in, a, in, a, in, in the new 21st century industry way. And the, the, the factory of the future would be more organic. So the 1990 logo, the last logo for factory was the sunshine plant. And this is the last slide tonight. Oh, I know, we'll to I know it's going to be. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. OK, so when Tony died. 2007? Yeah. Very prem prematurely, really. Um, I suppose, in a way, the hardest commission ever. I mean, you think things are difficult, but your friend's headstone. Duh. So Ben Kelly and I collaborated on Tony's headstone. Um, it's very 2001. Totally 2001 because we went to look, well, when Tony was actually buried, and I'd, I think I'd never been to a burial before. I, I'd, I'd, when, when grandparents and other people had died, it, there'd been cremations. And I don't think I'd ever been to a burial before. It's really weird. The whole thing's weird. They put you in the ground. Really? No. It's very, when you, when, I mean, I'm sure some people in the room, see, some, some won't have done. When you see somebody you know mm. lowered into the ground, it's really weird. Cremations are sort of almost funny because the coffin disappears through some curtains, like something, like something in an amusement arcade. And it's almost inappropriately comic. But burials are not, not comic at all. In fact, the whole day really got to me because there was a service and there was a coffin and, this, and I, I, would, I cried. I had to say something at the service and I cried. And Anyway, it was very weird. So, so the, the, there was the ceremony and then, and then everyone left and Anna and I, well, I don't know where we stayed, but we were then later that day leaving Manchester. And as we drove out from Manchester, south we, we we passed what is called southern cemetery where the funeral had been where the burial had been and this was several hours later and i turned and i suddenly turned to where we go and i said we can, let's go and see the site without all those people there so so we parked the car and we walked to where terry had, to tony had been buried and of course it was just soil there was nothing there there's flowers and it was really weird. Two things happened. After about five minutes, Alan Erasmus turned up. And he'd had, he'd had the same mm. feeling. And, you know, Alan was, in a way, Tony's best friend. And Alan had gone to smoke a joint with Tony. And it, he was quite touched that we were there. And I, you know, it was typical he was there. So, we, so 
we we stayed there by Tony's grave for you know half an hour or so, and I looked around. So this important thing, I looked at the the neighbours, and the neighbours were all rather grand. You can see Victorian and early twentieth century kind of big headstones, all of them, and and ornamental, all big ornamental headstones, and. They had found an extraordinary place for him because it was a very grand part of the cemetery. Um, and I'm thinking, what do you put here? So if I'd done a kind of closer headstone, it would have just blended in with everything else. So, but then I didn't wish to be vulgarly inappropriate. So 2001. So it, it, so it became um, this highly, highly, highly punished Indian black granite and rather than be stone cut the trendy headstone makers convinced me to have it laser cut so it's laser cut but it's roses well what well there was the other thing how do you choose the font i mean how do you choose the font and it's going to be there for a while and there will be no corrections and you can't redo it so how do you so and, and we haven't mentioned it this evening but there are a lot of time traces there are. We tried a lot of typefaces. And people. there's a lot of typefaces. And this was a really difficult decision. So therefore, I kind of, you know, use rules to make a decision and say the last official factory font was Rotus. We'll do it in Rotus. And actually, Matt Robinson, Robertson, Matt Robertson executed the type, I believe. Did you do it? Yeah, I did it. <laughs> I thought Matt had done it. And Paul Barnes executed the type. It must have, it must have pained you. Did it, did it pain you to use Rotus? Yes, I'm sure it did. Did you really do it? Yeah. What I'd say is, is Tony, Tony died in 2007, and I think this gravestone went up in 2009. So it's a very, very... There were, yes, but that was not entirely... My, obviously, there were all the yeah, no. Peter Savile jokes... Um, and there was a delay in the granite coming from India. But I do remember Tony, because I dropped in there several times over, because I was when I was doing the Manchester work for the city, and I would go by sometimes and, and, and you know, kind of, you know, sentimentally visit. And I remember going one evening, and there was like a, there was a note, there was a kind of a note encased in plastic saying, will Alan Erasmus please vote? So people were using Tony's grave as a kind of a message board. Yeah. They knew who would be dropping in and they were leaving messages for them. Anyway. Anyway, that's, that's Is really that our last thing. There were a lot more images to look at. I'm sorry we didn't get to look at them. Um, thank you for being a great audience. Um, I don't know if we're allowed any questions, are we? Because it's really late. Yeah. I apologise for not controlling this. I mean, uh, 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 Becky, we... Becky and Paul, w would it be quite good, like later in the year or something, to do part two? Do you know what I was going to ask that, but I'm yeah, glad you suggested there's, it. There's, okay. There's also, a lot. There's a lot of yeah. work done since the 80s. Absolutely. Actually, that in fact, since 2000, that that also, you know, illustrates this theme of of, of the sort of semiotic theme and the feeling of time. And it would be quite fun to do part two. I, um, I don't think we're going to hesitate in booking a date in tomorrow for that. OK, so um, We, honestly, everyone online has had such a fantastic evening. They've said it's the best talk they've ever been to at St. Bride. They could listen to you for the next 10 hours or longer. Everyone we, we is so happy, on. genuinely. And I think everyone in the room is feeling the same. It has been just a fantastic evening. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Thank you to everyone at your studio who's helped put together this fantastic presentation and make today oh, possible. And, and thank you to Paul Barnes as well for giving his time to make this happen. And thank you all for coming, everyone in the background at St. Bride for all your fantastic work and to Peter for the live streaming. And I feel like we need another round of applause for this fantastic man. Thank you, Becky.